Good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm Natalie Bungay and welcome to this webinar today. We're going to be talking about the principles of cluster fly control. Um, just a, a few normal little introductions and a bit of housekeeping, just so any of you that are new to webinars, you know um, how we're going to be working today. So um, just a quick, you'll see some of you have put some bits in the chat section already, but um, on the bottom of your screen, maybe to the top or the right of your screen, depending on what device you're using, you'll see a button that says chat. Now, what we want you to use this for is, you know, chat amongst yourselves, of course. If you want to ask any sort of, you know, general questions about the technology or how to do something, um, I've got a colleague of mine, Kat, who's keeping an eye on that chat section. Um, and of course, you can use it for that purpose. But also, if you've got any technical problems, so if my sound is particularly bad or the, the video is bad, um, you can put a, a comment in there just to let Kat know and she can give you some advice on how to sort that out. But hopefully all the stuff's looking good my end at the moment. Um, the other important bit is we have a Q&A button. Now that's different to the chat section. The Q&A button is just for questions about the webinar, about the about cluster flies to me that you want me to have a look at read through and then I'll um, yeah attempt to do my best at answering your questions. You know, cluster flies, is it a big topic? I suppose, you know, I think we can do a good amount in an hour, um, but I may not cover something that you maybe were expecting or possibly I'd start talking about um, a topic and, uh, you know, you want some more detail on it. So get those questions in there. If there's anything that I come across and uh, I'm not sure of the answer because, you know, I don't know everything. I like to think I do, but I definitely don't. Um, then, of course, what I'll do is I'll get those questions sent out on an email so that we can uh, yeah, at least get those answers for everybody. OK, um, we have one CBD point for today. So if you're on the BBCA registered scheme or the prompt scheme um, where there's one point available, all of you that are here, there's uh, 199 individuals at the moment. So all of you should have registered um, on our website and input that CPD number that you have associated with your account. And if you've done that, we'll get those points allocated. Anybody who might be watching this afterwards, so, you know, not live, it's this session is recorded, so we'll be uploading our website and YouTube later on. If you are watching it non-live, if that's a term, um, then you'll need to go and register that point yourself. So just get in touch with the relevant scheme and we'll um, help you out with that and all prompt, basic prompt will help you out with that. OK, um, so I don't, hopefully there won't be any technical issues. What I'm going to do, I think that's about all of it. Just one thing I mentioned at the end as well. Um, hopefully most of you will be aware that we have Pestex um, live down at the Excel Centre confirmed for next March. So March 2022. Um, and it'd be great for anybody here that wants to attend Pestex in March that you can get registered. My colleague Kat will share the link in the chat section for you to be able to do that. Um, I'll give you a quick reminder at the end as well, because it's a great event. XL in London. Be great to see you all there. And of course, I'll be there. Come and have a chat to me. OK, right. I'm going to share my screen. If anything's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong now. But um, I think that's worked OK. Great. Good stuff. And I think the sound seems OK. Um, I haven't had. Let me I just have a quick chat. Uh, yeah, it looks like you're all OK and you can hear me OK. Fab, so cluster fly control then. now. Just to, to manage your expectations in, in what I'm going to cover in this. Now, many of you know, um, and I'm never shy at saying I'm not an entomologist and this is not an entomology lesson. Um, but we will look at some you know, basic identifying characteristics the stuff that's important to you when you're out in the field. You're looking at these flies on a windowsill or you know, caked around a, um, a, um, a window frame or in an attic, or maybe a customer might send you a photograph of it, you know, those characteristics that help you identify it. Um, and, and where and when you're going to expect cluster flies. So um, you can, as a pest professional, advise your customers, you know, properly and be able to deal with the infestation. So that's what we're going to cover today. Um, hopefully, in all of that, I'll get everything that you're expecting today. But like I said, any any questions you've got, get it in that Q&A section. All right. Kat will advise you if anybody missed that and starts putting questions in the chat section, we'll advise you to put it in the Q&A because I probably won't see it. Um, OK, so that's what we do. So identifying them, some basics, um, when and where to expect them and some treatment options. OK. Um, so just as a. Um, uh, a quick before we start this actually let me go back one page because I've, I've got a 
I've got a poll question. My colleague Kat's going to pop it up now. And basically what I want to know from you guys is today's the first day of autumn. Um, and as we know, we may get cluster flies starting now. So just how many of you have actually started with call outs for cluster flies? Um, it'd be great to see that just to get an idea of what's happening out there. Um, different parts of the country, I'm sure we'll... Uh, We'll experience different things. So I'll give you a few more seconds just to answer that. I can see you all clicking away. That's fantastic. We've got 222 individuals with us today and we're up to about 140 have put their options in. I'm going to give you another you know, 10, 10 seconds or so. We're nearly at capacity. So I'm going to end the poll in five. Oh, I won't count down. Okay, I'm going to end that now just so that we can see. So we have, I'm going to share the results on the screen. You should be able to see that. So yeah, most of you, 55% um, of you haven't had those calls yet. So great. You know, this webinar has maybe got you just in time, um, just in time to be able to, you know, get some of those, that, that, that basic identifying characteristics and um, uh, things for you to think about when you're coming across cluster flies. And, but, you know, 38% of you have, you know, you've received those calls in, you're out there dealing with them now. So it's still useful, hopefully this for you, because I'm sure over the next few weeks, maybe months, um, we're going to carry on with those call outs. Um, and then there's a few that are not sure, maybe you're in a larger company and maybe you haven't had them yourself, but possibly some of your colleagues have. Okay, great. I'll stop sharing that. It's good to know that. So we've got a, we've got a relatively um, even split in terms of yes and no's there. So I'm going to carry on with um, going into a bit of identification. Now, uh, normally I, I would do a poll on this as well, just ask you guys to, um, you know, identify themselves, just give you a moment to have a look at them. But one of these is a, say, a common cluster fly, Polynarudis is the um, scientific name. Um, and we also have uh, a green cluster fly. You can probably all guess which one that is. So uh, we've got a green cluster fly here. This is something they're not as common. We, we may see them out in the garden, you know, resting on plants, um, you know, mints and some of the herbs. Have, I've certainly seen them out, out and about. Um, we confuse them with green bottles sometimes. But, you know, if you take a closer look, usually under a microscope, you can identify it through different hairs and structures of the eyes that will tell you whether or not it's a, um, a green cluster fly or a, a green bottle, which both are very different. I'll talk about those more specifically in a moment. But the identification is quite key. These all do look quite Quite different as you can see but they've all got characteristics of clustering um, and again i'll go into that in a moment um, we've also got the autumn fly also known as the face fly um, now this is this image here is um the male as you can see it's got um a white uh sorry a, a yellow coloration on its abdomen there and it's more black on its on its thorax but if we have a look at the female it's quite a lot different isn't it and i've actually seen some of these face flies um in my home, you know, I've found a couple of them dead, some of them alive, you know, got my electric fly swatter out and, and killed them and, and had a good look. And I'm seeing these appearing um, in my home. They're not in massive numbers at the moment, um, but I am seeing them. Um, you know, sometimes you might look at them and think, is that a cluster fly? Is that a common house fly? You know, you're kind of thinking about yourself, but it's this patterns that you've got here. You've also, you've got it on both ends, the thorax and the abdomen. You've got this gray coloration um, uh, that, that's quite clear and it's quite interesting to see. So maybe some of you have seen this, um, customers calling you out about fly issues and you get this face fly. Again, I'll go into a bit more detail in a moment. And then here we have the more common species that most of us are going to be dealing with, um, the cluster fly, Polynarudis. Um, we're going to see this and it's got quite, um, you know, identifying characteristics to it. So you've got the golden hairs and sort of specks there on the, on the top of its thorax and its abdomen is more of a, can't quite see it in this image here, but a, a patterned grey colour, a bit similar to the face fly here, um, back on its uh, abdomen there. So Good to identify these. We're going to be seeing a lot of flies this time of year. As we know, the weather's getting a bit cooler now. So the cold weather is always going to bring dead insects, isn't it? Or lazy insects, um, uh, sluggish insects. So good to good to have an idea of these. Of course, you're going to find lots of different, other, different fly species, but these are the ones that are mostly associated with clustering. We have another one, yellow swarming fly. I'll uh, go into that again in a moment. 
So just have a look at the phase fly and the green cluster fly. This is this is going to be real sort of um, fly by your seat stuff. Again, if you've got any extra questions, please ask them. And like I said, if uh, um, if I'm not sure of the answer, I'll come back to you later on in emails. But the phase fly, it looks very similar to um, house fly and also a cluster fly in many ways to a degree, um, clearly defined by its striped grey and yellow abdomen. Um, and that's the male, the image we looked at in the moment. And you'll see here this, this image of a horse. The these are the female um, face flies that you get feeding from the secretions from um, usually livestock, cows and horses, secretions, I can say that word, uh, from their eyes and nose um, and mouth also they feed from that. And it's always usually the females. Female face flies need a lot more protein than the males. Um, so things like um, obviously feeding these some secretions, but also as we know, livestock do get bitten by horse flies. And I don't know if anybody here has been bitten by a horse fly uh, before, but it's quite painful and it, it's quite a um, uh, quite quite a bite. You know, it leaves quite an, a, a big indentation and you can get blood that seeps from that as well. So these uh, face flies can sometimes feed from that blood that's resulted from a uh, horse fly bite, for example. As I said, it's usually always the females. They need this higher protein content. Um the, the eggs of the face fly are laid in animal dung normally. The larvae feed on the dung and then pupate in the soil. Um, and as you can see, like I said, from this image, animals will, uh, adults will cluster on the face of livestock, feeding from those um, secretions. Um, you know, in terms of uh, the face fly, you know, most are likely to inv invade farm homes and homes located near pastures or um, where cattle are kept of course makes sense doesn't it where they're breeding these areas we're normally going to get them associated with those buildings that are a little bit more possible rural and associated with um, livestock um i've actually seen as i said a couple of um these in my conservatory the female face fly recently um so you know it's just important not to confuse them with the common cluster fly we don't generally get as many problems in the homes uh, that we see but again if you're working out in the countryside maybe you will We'll see both species there because all of these cluster flies, they can actually cluster together for very often. You'll see, um, you know, cross species clustering together and it's not always just the one. Um, in terms of the uh, green cluster fly, it's another species where the larvae develop on, on fecal matter. It's lovely, isn't it? Um, and, you know, the larvae are usually on the dung and pupate in the soil. Um, and like I said, adults can and will cluster in mixed swarms sometimes. If you see that and you've got a property that's particularly bad with cluster flies and you notice a, a few different looking species amongst there, it's, it's probably, you know, um, the common cluster, cluster fly, face fly, maybe the green cluster fly. Um, so with um, going forward on to just a little bit more information about the yellow swarming fly that I mentioned earlier, um, it's a small fly about the size of a fruit fly, maybe about three millimeters. Um, it, it's fairly large rounded wings um, in relation to the quite smallish yellow body. It's quite an attractive looking fly, actually. I know there's some people that they would call this one of their favorite pest species in terms of um, visual satisfaction because, you know, they're quite colorful, aren't they? And quite attractive to look at and quite distinctive. I think if you were going to come across the yellow swarming flies, you wouldn't have too much of a problem identifying them. Um, very distinctive. Um, and, and the characteristics here is that, you know, they belong to um, a family of grass flies. Um, the larvae usually living the roots of grasses. They are, the, the larvae are carnivorous, mainly preying on root aphids. So, um, you can get them clustering in roof spaces, commonly old churches. That's just from case studies that have been seen out there before. Um, you know, I've seen examples um, of this fly originating from, uh, say, guttering that's got quite a lot of foliage growing out of it. You know, sometimes if those gutters are not maintained enough, you can get a lot of um, soil and then resulting foliage growing out of it. And, and yeah, I've certainly seen um, these uh, yellow swarming flies taken advantage of that. Um, so they're not as common, um, but they are in large numbers when they're present. So, yeah, as I said, quite an anomaly. But some of you may have come across that yellow swarming fly. So a bit of an identification there. 
Um, hopefully that that's helped out a little bit. But just to go into a bit more detail with our more common cluster fly that we we come across. Sorry, I spelled calling a rudis wrong there. Um, meant to be an O um, uh, spelling mistake. Should have done this before, really, shouldn't I? I'll blame someone else. Um, but yeah, it's pollen erudis. Um, they're a complete metamorphosis. So uh, most of you here, are, you know, different levels of experience. I think they'll be here. Some really, really um, long term, long standing technicians that are well aware of, you know, metamorphosis, complete and incomplete. But also maybe some new technicians that would like me to go into that a little bit more, which I will because it's important. So with uh, all flies, um, talking about cluster flies, the complete metamorphosis is from it, it consists of four elements. So we have an egg. We have a larvae, we have a pupae, and we have an adult. That's called a complete metamorphosis. An incomplete metamorphosis is three stages. So you'll have the egg, which will then hatch out into um, a lar uh, sorry, a nymph, which is basically a smaller version of the adult. Um, and then that will um, molt through different stages, varying stages into the adult insect. But for cluster flies, we have a complete metamorphosis. So the egg is laid. Um, and that hatches out into a larvae, which then pupates, and then the adult emerges. Um, so this is, the cluster fly is a, a free living field insect. Um, the life cycle is really dependent on weather conditions. Um, just so you can see here, they've got those golden hairs on the thorax. Um, what this cluster fly does, so the female will lay their eggs in dead and rotting leaves and vegetation vegetation so pretty much anywhere there is foliage or trees or shrubs and you know you may get city areas suburban areas where it's a maybe people call it a concrete jungle you probably won't get as many issues with cluster flies i won't say you'll never get any issues with cluster flies because of course they can fly some distance to find their overwintering spot but generally and more normally it's going to be in the more um rural or or um, sub-rural areas where you've got a lot more foliage and trees and shrubs so what happens is that leg is that egg is laid amongst these rotting leaves that egg would usually take hatch in about one week so the larvae will hatch out it will seek out an earthworm so this is really this is really important information for anybody that's new to cluster flies or the biology of cluster flies and how they work because you know, the, the control matters. So when that larvae hatches out amongst that foliage, it will burrow down into the soil. It will seek out an earthworm and this is what it parasites. So that larvae will burrow itself into that earthworm to feed within it. It's pretty nasty, isn't it? it sounds quite alien-like, um, but that's what the larvae feeds on. And the larvae will also leave its hind outside of the hole that it makes within this earthworm. And that's so that it, um, you know, it allows oxygen into the spiracle of the larvae so that it can breathe. Um, and then once the larvae um, is, is done with the earthworm or the earthworm is, you know, near or already dead, the larvae balls out again and then it pupates in the soil. This can take several weeks. Um, and then once again, this is all weather dependent, isn't it? And food source dependent as with all insects. Um, but these timescales are generally uh, or a, a general um, thing to consider. So that happens in a couple of weeks. So you've got that pupae there. It's waiting to go through, um, grow itself into the adult, the adult fly. Um, and then it will emerge, um, you know, in hot summers when, when it's quite hot weather. You know, you can have up to four generations per year um, that will, will go through. It really depends on the weather um, and how long that lasts. So eggs laid in amongst foliage, the larvae hatch out or appear. They'll dig down, find a earthworm to parasite. Once they're done with that earthworm and you know kicks it to the curb, they'll um, then return to the surface, pupate, and then hatch out into the adult. Now, this is really important in terms of control techniques, um, which I'll go on to in a moment. But mainly, you know, what can we do about vegetation? What can we do about that rotting vegetation that could be anywhere and all around us? There's, there's not much is there. Um, but I'll go into that a little bit. Um, a little bit later on. Um, so, and also with, with the adult um, flies, when we come across them, certainly in homes, they're usually quite sluggish compared to say house flies that we see, you know, they're um, not as mobile um, and usually quite easy to catch with your electric fly killer if you happen to have one at home like I do. Um, so they're usually quite, quite sluggish when they get into people's houses. And of course, when we see them in that real clustering um, stage, again, they're pretty sluggish, you can usually tell. 
Um, so yeah, it's um, quite an, an interesting fly, you know, quite different to maybe, you know, associate other things with, you know, bins and things like that, and we can deal with it. Um, but with cluster flies, um, not the case. It's all about the uh, rural environment. Um, it says, you know, adults are herbivores, mainly feeding on plants, sap, fruit, flowers. Again, a lot of flies do that. Um, they actually do feed from flowers. And, you know, what does that say to you? They're pollinators as well, aren't they? Um, because of that physical process that happens from flies landing on a flower, feeding, and then maybe moving to another wire, another one. That's how um, flowers will um, uh, mass produce. So from that physical movement of insects from flower to flower. So a bit about there about cluster fly, Polonarudis. Um, so the reasons for control, you know, cluster flies are conspicuously abundant flies. You know, they're best known to general public for their habit of clustering on walls and entering the walls of attics, homes. And this is to overwinter. So, you know, sticking with Polonarudis, the reason why we see them this time of year is why. I've already mentioned it, it's getting colder. Today's the first day of autumn. We can all tell it's a bit cooler. I almost put my jumper on um, today, but I've just managed to um, uh, keep it off and just about warm enough. But it's getting cooler, isn't it? And, you know, these um, cluster flies do need to overwinter to then reappear in spring to carry on um, their breeding cycle. But right now it's getting cooler. They're going to be seeking out that overwintering spot. Some people call it hibernation, but technically it's more of an overwinter. Um, they're going to go into like a diapause and they'll they'll wait for that weather to get warmer. It'd be nice if a lot of us could do that, wouldn't it? Um, so this is this is why we're going to see it. Um, you know, when they become active in early spring or on a warm winter days, they can become a real nuisance um, in houses. And the appearance appearance of large numbers of these flies inside houses is often a matter of concern for homeowners and home builders um, and the subsequent accumulation of dead adult flies around windows can lead to also allergy problems. Um, in terms of um, diseases, there's no known pathogens, but if you think about it, I suppose, you know, with the green cluster fly, you know, I mentioned there that they they lay their eggs in, in dung and they feed from the, the, the byproducts of that. So if you're getting cluster fly, um, sorry, green cluster flies in your house and they've been, you know, recently landed on some fecal matter and then they're in your property, possibly they could, couldn't they? Um, you know, speaking more of, of Polynarudis, they don't so much. They don't really land in the traditional dirty areas we think of, you know, of flies, you know, house flies or blue bottles or green bottles. We, they don't really really alight in areas that are of particular um, disease or, or pathogen concerns. But, you know, it's still it's still always something to think about. You know, um, contamination, you know, we may not consider cluster flies as a contamination issue, but, you know, you imagine that you've got cluster flies in um, causing an issue around uh, in, in attics or, or, or window cracks and crevices in a food production um, building, whether it's production or it might be a restaurant or a takeaway, you know, there is a possible of contamination there. The, the fly's body itself, you know, dying and then falling into, you know, uh, an area we don't want them, a, a clean, sanitized area. So, you know, they, they can be a contamination issue. Um, also, also a secondary infestation. So, um, for example, where you might have uh, large numbers of dead uh, cluster flies, because of course they're in large numbers. So if you're going to get dead cluster flies, maybe it's a treatment someone's done themselves, amateur use, or maybe it's a professional that's done the cluster fly treatment. If we don't clear those flies away, then you can get secondary infestations from domestic beetles um, feeding from those those dead carcasses. Um, I also think you know you get can get carpet beetles as well. They I believe they feed from fly carcasses. So it's important that you know we we try and um, remove any of the um, dead flies that are resulted from any treatment we may do. We'll have a look at that in a moment. Um, but just a, a, an interesting story. Um, I say a story. It's a very brief comment, really. There was a, an incident some years ago where um, a train, um, I say it was derailed. There was a, a, an accident that occurred and it was because the driver of that train didn't see a red light that asked him to stop. Um, and that was because cluster flies had cause an obstruction to that light and the driver couldn't see that it was a red light. Um, so he passed straight through it and there was a, I believe it was a collision. Um, and so it can cause some real health and safety concerns in some, you know, um, certain situations. So it's really important that 
um, if, if, if they are causing an issue in, in sensitive areas like that, that we can maybe have some things we can do to deal with them. But unfortunately, like I'll mention a moment, it's hard to actually um, prevent them. Um, the, the, in terms of controlling, you know, cluster flies, the a survey is needed. Do you know what? Let me just go back to, I'm going to go back to one area here. So I want to talk a bit more um, about the, um, uh, say, physical, the prevention. So in terms of preventing cluster flies, because, you know, I've been talking about them laying their eggs in um, soil and rotting leaves, things like that. Um, how how can we address that? You know, if we've got an issue with, uh, let's say, house flies and we're um, someone's house and they've got an overflowing bin or uh, there's a neighbouring restaurant that's got overflowing bins or you've got maybe a waste site nearby, you know, you, you can you can figure out the root cause and go, right, let's try and sort that out. Let's get the local authority to help us out with that waste site or, you know, let's get them bins covered up or let's get that waste, you know, taken away and, you know, Hopefully that will sort the problem out and then we can, we don't have to use too many chemicals. That's normally that's the approach we have with most things, you know, and especially flies. Whereas with cluster flies, because where they breed, because they are, you know, out in the fields, they they lay their eggs anywhere um, where it has rotting leaves and foliage and lead the soil. We, we can't rip these areas up. We can't go out and do landscaping to um, take away that breeding area. We just can't. It's not possible. Um, and we don't want to, of course. We don't want to just, uh, you know, concrete up an entire, um, you know, three, four square mile area. It's just not possible. So, you know, when we're, when you're talking to your customers and they ask you for prevention um, uh, advice, it's very difficult to be able to um, say to your customers, sorry, but you know, there isn't much you can do to prevent this. Maybe a few things, I'll go into it in a moment, but we can't directly address that um, harborage area, which we normally do with most other pest species. Okay, I will touch on that again in a moment. And let's just go forward into controlling cluster flies then. So we've had a look at how they breed. Um, how to identify them again, you know, relatively straightforward stuff, um, but controlling them, maybe not as straightforward. So the first thing we always need to do is um, a site survey. A survey doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, war and peace or a novel that you're writing or a long document, but you do need to always do two things. So a safety survey and a survey on activity levels. This is what's going to give you your um, uh, your uh, control approach, the, the thing that you need to do for that site-specific problem. Um, you know, why not note on your treatment reports? This is why I always consider encourage people to do it doesn't matter what you're doing you know wasps or rats or cluster flies you know if you're doing a survey and you're noticing certain things and you're you know picking up certain areas where there's more activity than anywhere else then make sure you write this down because it's great information to give your customer and they always the more information they get the more they appreciate it um you know, although, you know, it's the same pest, every site will have its own challenges. So, you know, again, in terms of safety, things like, you know, naked flames or water tanks, if it's in an attic, um, it might be, of course, um, vulnerable people or even non-target species like pets and cats. So really important that you do that. Um, uh, so once you've done that, you'll, you'll have a look at, you know, housekeeping and hygiene. Now, if you get to a site and there's already quite a lot of dead cluster flies and of course your advice on housekeeping is always to get rid of those so that no secondary infestations come about and, it, and it's good practice um of course cluster flies for example if you were to deal with an issue today um in a property and your customer says oh great i'm not gonna get these flies back again am i to, you know this year it's not always something you can guarantee um, there could be a few occurrences of it. So if I had cluster flies here on my windows and you came out and sorted it out for me, um, there's a possibility, you know, a few days, maybe even weeks later could have reoccurrence. But um, that's maybe where sometimes chemical control can help, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but yeah, that housekeeping um, is certainly important to remove those dead flies that might have occurred um, before you get there, you know, maybe speak to them on the phone before you arrive and say, look, any dead flies you've got, hoover them up. Um, and maybe even the live ones. I've done that a few times. You know, I've had a fly I don't want and chasing it with the hoover end, you know, just because it's annoying me a little bit. Uh, maybe they could do that. But they need to make sure they 
um, you know, those resulting flies that are caught in that, that vacuum bag is always a, a tricky thing. So it's a consideration, but more so the dead flies rather than the live, the live flies. Because um, as I said, given that advice on how to deal with those uh, resulting flies in a, in a vacuum bag is, is tricky. Um, so proofing. Proofing, what can you say? Ooh, we can prove the flies not to come into the property. You know, if someone gets a problem year on year, which always happens. So again, another bit that um, um, I failed to mention earlier, and an important bit as well, is that when these cluster flies find a property they like, they go, yeah, this is nice. This is nearby where, um, you know, we've been, uh, been, been laying our eggs and where we are. We're going to shoot that building. We want to get in there. Well, it seems warm. We want to overwinter. And, you know, that person's got a problem. Now, they will probably get a problem year after year. Um, and that's mainly because the flies, when they're clustering, they leave aggregation pheromones behind um, just from their presence and their droppings, things like that. So, of course, when the following year comes round to the autumn, when, you know, a new generation is thinking, right, where am I going to go to overwinter? They're going to seek out those pheromones. They're going to detect those pheromones. And they're going to think that must be a good place because, you know, my mates have been there before. I'm going to set up home there. I'm going to overwinter in that area. So that's why we can see that reoccurring. It's those pheromones that are, are left behind from the aggregating uh, cluster flies from the season before. Now, you might think, can we clean that off? There's no harm in trying. You know, the key thing here is you, you, know, you speak to your customers, you communicate with them about, you know, um, expectations and what to expect now if we wipe around the window edges and we try and get you know some of that dirt off that's left behind from them some of that aggregation pheromones there it's not going to hurt is it but it can't be i wouldn't say that you could reliably see it as a yep yeah, that will prevent other flies from detecting it next year um, but it may help in the reduction if those cluster flies are more common in the attic which we get so cluster flies will Sometimes you get them around windows in lower areas of the property, and sometimes you'll get up into an attic and they're absolutely, you know, I say swarming, clustering um, in large, large numbers, and sometimes both as well. Now, if you've got them in, a, in an attic space, you can't really go wipe, wiping down your roof tiles where they might have come in or um, the soffits and things like that. It, it's difficult. But if, you, you know, if you've got an area that's maybe localised and it seems to be around a couple of certain uh, windows that open and you see those flies falling out from um, cracks and crevices, then you know, it doesn't hurt to give it um, a clean and a wipe down. Um, it can only help, um, not necessarily prevent completely. Um, so that wiping down and the proofing. Now, uh, you know, there is an example, I think with sash windows, for example, the way they're constructed with the, um, the cords that go down the outside of the frame of the um, sash window. Sometimes the flies can get access there and they can like it. And I think you can put mesh around these areas just to stop them getting in that, that void there. But still, is it gonna, is it gonna stop them getting access? possibly to a degree, but not completely. Um, you know, flies are small, aren't they? They don't need a large gap to squeeze through. You know, they could, you could probably struggle to see most holes that a fly could get through. So, you know, proofing can be tricky, but, you know, consider things like fly screens. Maybe it would help. Um, something to think about site specific, like I said, a survey, but proofing and hygiene can help, but won't necessarily stop a problem occurring year after year. Um, so after we consider these things, we've done a survey, we've maybe advised on a bit of cleaning they can do. If there is any proofing, great. Um, and the next thing we may want to consider is uh, electrical fly killers. Now, you'll notice here I'm, I'm doing all the non-toxic stuff first. That's the hierarchy of controls that we should all follow all of the time with all pest work that we do. Always look at the, you know, managing the environment if we can, you know, cleaning and housekeeping and proofing. So really important. Um, and then, you know, non-toxic pest control as well. So um, electrical fly killers. Now, really is site specific. I can't say to you, this EFK is wonderful for this type of site. It will depend on the area size, um, which will depend on the size of the unit you might need, um, and also whether or not that area is suitable for an electric fly killer to go up. Um, for example, sometimes if it's in an attic, you can put an electrical fly killer up there, um, but you need to do your safety checks. You need to make sure there's no risk, there's no risk of fire, um, and certainly things like bats, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but 
look at look at electrical fire fly killers. Now, the normal process for EFKs for cluster fly control would be, you know, this time of year it's it's installed. You pick the right machine for you, doing your risk assessment, talking to your suppliers, um, saying to them, this is a situation I've got. What machine do you recommend? OK, I'm not going to tell you what machine I recommend because that's up to your suppliers to do um, with you on discussing your site specific conditions. Um, but there's different sizes. You've got glue boards, you've got kill grids and things like that. And it will depend on the number of cluster flies that you have. So, you know, if you if you picture a traditional electrical fly killer that you get in you know restaurants and bars, um, you know, it's quite a small catch tray. Now we can get thousands of cluster flies in in one space in at one time. So if you put a traditional EFK up on the wall that's got a small catch tray, you know, not only you're not going to have enough space for there, but that's a real fire hazard as well because you know those dead carcasses are building up and building up, and you've got an electrical fly grid there that could cause some fire issues. Um, so normally with electrical fire killers that are in roof spaces or are there specifically for cluster flies, um, that tray will be removed now. Most of you will know who are familiar with electrical fly killers. Normally, when you remove that catch tray, it will automatically shut off the um, uh, EFK. So um, there are certain uh, products that you can get that are considerate of that. Again, speak to your suppliers. You know, I haven't used these machines uh, for a fair bit of time. There's lots of new ones that come out and fancy designs. So, you know, have a chat to them. They'll, they'll be able to tell you which one's best for you. But the important thing is, is that you've got that space underneath the EFK for when all these flies are going to get caught on this kill grid and they're falling down, that you've got a way to catch them. Now, we need to be careful with putting things like bags under EFKs, it's not a problem to do it, to catch them, you know, big large bags hanging from it. But, you know, if we're using plastics or we're using, you know, um, uh, paper sort of bags, things like that, again, you've got to think about the risks. You know, is there any fire risk or anything like that? Sometimes you could put a big, massive bin underneath, you know, you might do it where they, they all get caught in there. Um, there's a few different ways, but electrical fire clothes can be really good. A non-toxic control method, usually turn it on at a certain time of year, um, and then, you know, once that cluster fly season um, has, has reduced, there's no, I would say generally by uh, mid to late November, you'll see a close to cluster flies. It could be a lot earlier. Um, it, it can vary. It really depends on the weather, like I said, and the area that you're in. You may have an area that's particularly bad with them and they go on for some time. Um, but generally, you know, you turn them on for a couple of months. And then once we get to a time of the year where you're confident, yep, they've stopped now. No more. You can turn that device off and then um, it's no longer in use, saves everybody, um, you know, that electric, electric cost and uh, bulb um, cost as well. I think the bulbs you do still need to change every year, but that's the whole EFK talk. I'm not here to talk about EFKs too much, um, but they're, they're, they're a handy tool. You know, if you do have customers that have reoccurring issues um, in large spaces, then EFKs can be a really great tool because then when you come around to spring, when um, these overwintering adults have you know had a nice little sleep and they think oh it's warming up a little bit and they come out from those overwintering spots exactly the same problem is going to happen that's happening maybe now or over the next couple of weeks but rather than the flies trying to get in the building those flies are trying to get out of the building to go and do their thing you know lay their eggs in that um rotting uh leaves and and vegetation and feeding on the flowers and pollinating and doing all the lovely things that they do. Um, so yeah, in spring, it starts warming up, they're going to be exiting. So again, be a time of year that you'll get that EFK on just to control those numbers if it's causing concern to your customers. Um, but yeah, lots of different devices, speak to your supplier. Now, chemical control. So um, we, you know, it is an option, of course it is your decision to survey your site and if you think do you know what the you know, recommendations are given them and that efk i've placed i think that'll do a job you know i'll come back i'll you know you could even get a contract for efk to come back at certain times of each year to maintain it um to check it you know to clear up those flies those resulting dead flies that you get um really up to you what you want to do with that it can be ongoing work which is is always good but chemical control there is a place for it um you know in the hierarchy of things we always want it to be the last thing you consider but if say you know it is something you need to knock those flies down quickly if the placement and the arrangement for an efk is just not um gonna 
going to cut the mustard uh, for this particular call out that you've got and you need that control now, then chemical control can be the way to go. So, um, you know, we've got things like space uh, space um, like ULVs, ultra low volume particles that are released through a ULV machine. Um, these all knock down the adults only. So like I said, we, we can't control the larvae. We can't get to that area where the larvae are breeding um, to, to stop that breeding cycle. We can't do it. Um, same with the pupae um, and the same, same with the egg. We can't clear it up. We can't clean it up or, or spray it or do anything with it. It's only the adult that we can really focus our attention on. So that EFK placement, that's dealing with the adult, isn't it? And the same with the chemical control. So doing space treatments with ULV, ultra low volume uh, particles, for anybody who doesn't know that, it, it's kind of crossed between a, a traditional spray and a, and a fog. It's in between there, the particles. It kind of, they hang around in space for a bit longer and then they fall slowly. So any flying insects, those adults that are flying in that space, will come into contact with it and then and then drop to the floor and, and die. So it's that, you know, quick control. It's that knockdown of those adults that are possibly causing a, you know, a huge nuisance, maybe contamination. Um, you know, I've had a couple of cluster fly, cluster fly, <laughs> cluster fly um, issues in, in schools, for example, where, you know, there's a classroom and there's a, you know, a whole classroom of kids due in the next day and of course they can't sit in a classroom with you know thousands of flies uh buzzing around it's, it's going to cause a bit of chaos isn't it um if, if if nothing else which obviously we don't want want in a learning environment so i've had that before um i think those situations used a, an ultra low volume you know you have to mark out the area you have to um you know look at your your space your volume because on those product labels it'll tell you um how long you need that ultra low volume machine turned on for to be able to cover that space but it's absolutely it's a good option if it's safe to do so and you've done your risk assessment and you think yeah that's the way to go um speak to your suppliers about the different um products that you can get um, but yeah ulv machines good for space treatments and knocking those flying adults down um and then also so crack and crevice with additional spray and liquid concentrates um i mentioned earlier about you know cluster flies quite commonly um clustering around the cracks and crevices around windows you have it where you're kind of doing your survey and you you pop the window open and they just kind of you know fall out sluggishly like i mentioned out of the uh the the seams of the window um you can normally see them before you even do that but by by opening that you can certainly see the extent of those cluster flies that are you know uh, clustering around those um uh, uh grooves and cracks and crevices around windows so if you have that um you can use some products to, you know, possibly apply to those surfaces so that, you know, once you've, you've done your control and you've got rid of those adults, like I said before, you could get another occurrence, you know, a couple of days or weeks later, you could have another surge of cluster flies. So if you've got that um, residual insecticide that's in those aggregation areas, those areas where those, those flies are going to um, cluster into, then that residual insecticide you've got there should help with, with dealing with them. So again, speak to suppliers, look at labels, make sure you can use it for what you can use it for. Make sure the surface um, is correct for the insecticide. So porous surfaces, where it might be um, a smooth surface, it's different. You, you've got to look at your product formulation. Again, speak to your suppliers about it. So yeah, space treatments, you can do some surface treatments to get that residual effect to, to deal with any, any um, further problems coming, a, um, coming along. Okay, um, I'm, I will touch on that again um, a little bit more. I can't believe what time it is and how quickly this is all gone. So let me move on a little bit. The other um, important bit is, is, is communicating with your customers, um, letting them know the likeliness of them never returning, i.e. if you've got them once, there's a good chance you're going to get them again. They might not. I mean, I'm sure some of you here have had customers that have had it once and you've never had a call back again. You know, this is five years ago and you think, oh, maybe they never got a problem again. Maybe they're lucky enough. But, you know, communicating with them and making them realize that, you know, your guarantee is not, I'm going to knock these all down for you and you'll never have a problem again. Okay. Speak to them. You don't want them coming back to you and complaining and saying, Oh, I've got some more cluster flies that, you know, a week later. And they're like, Oh, you told me they wouldn't come back or, um, you know, that treatment you done didn't work. Educate them right from the start that that could happen. 
Okay, and it's not your fault necessarily. Um, you know, don't beat around the bush. Pun intended. Um, be be honest with them. Okay. So I mentioned I'm just going to go into just mention it again. I've got a few slides that are more specific, give you a bit of an image here. So um, I've said about vacuuming the flies up, getting some EFKs in, and fly strips are another thing. So there's an image here as you can see. Um, yeah, if you've got a customer that's you know it's maybe not a a really really bad problem it's just you know pretty annoying and they don't want any fk inks it's not suitable and they don't really want any chemical control because they've got all sorts of animals there and they're worried about it then you can get things like fly strips which you know um usually in a in a, in a small package you kind of open it up and pull them out and it's a big long dangly strip of loveliness that the flies like and they attach themselves to it um and of course the flies no longer so they, they can work really well as well um quite a, an easy solution maybe some that you can get to your customers um they can purchase off of you i don't believe there's any issue with that again read the label make sure that's okay um but they're they're a good tool to have with you this time of year I um, mentioned about fly units. There's uh, a sticky board. So I've mentioned about the kill grids that, you know, traditional fly comes into it, you know, it you know, evaporates the thing, it explodes up and down it goes, falls into your bin or your bag or your catch tray. Um, whereas glue boards, it may be more appropriate that you have a glue board system. They will need to be checked more often if you've got quite a substantial cluster fly problem because, you know, of course, it's one glue board. Once that's full of flies, you ain't really going to get much else sticking on there. So a bit more labor intensive, but again, an option if you feel that is more suitable for you. Um, chemical control, again, I'm just uh, reiterating everything that I've, I've gone over already, but, um, you know, you need to obviously measure up the area. Um, this this image here is is I know it's, it's a waste site. We could get cluster flies on a waste site, I guess you know. Um, uh, but it's just to demonstrate that this is a fogger um, and another possible option. Not the most common option for cluster flies, um, but possibly it might be something you want to consider. But not the most likely. Um, usually things like smoke, so smoke generators, uh, different brands out there. Something you can you can light the wick. I think there are safer smoke generators now that don't have that. Uh, need for that naked flame or that spark because of course if we're in attics and there's a risk of fire or you know we can't have sparks in the area then there are sparklists i think they're called again speak to your supplier um but yeah smoke generators are quite good for space treatments um and aerosols you have these um i think they call them total release aerosols um where you kind of you know push the button get out you know obviously have your mask on leave the room and it fills that room with the aerosol knocks those adults down like i said there's a common theme here isn't there you know there's different products we could use but the general concept is the same is that there's adult flies in the room i need to knock them down and it's choosing the best thing for you best option for your site and your customer um and again like i mentioned the ulv the ultra low volume particles that we have released into the space um you know we need to do our health and safety checks so um really really important of course you know there could be electrics in the loft space um we've got to assess moving around as well because you know you, you get up into loft space that's fine there's a nice ladder here as you can see in the image it's safe to get up but you know if you've got you can see here i think that's a christmas tree um possibly a fire risk um also, you know, you could have some wildlife up there. You've got to make sure that, you know, you check for these things. I'll talk about that in a bit more in a moment. Um, but also the boarding. So make sure if, if you're if you're needing to go up into an attic to survey it or put an EFK unit up or do a treatment, you know, you've got to make sure you can move around properly. And, you know, if there's any low roofs as well, or ceilings that, you know, you're wearing the right PPE, things like, you know, hard hats. Um, but if you if it's if it's feels unsafe to move around or a bit tricky or there's a risk of you tripping, then, you know, you've got to re reassess your situation, maybe get some crawl boards or speak to your customer about making it safer up there. But think about your movement. OK. Um, and again, like I've said, with EFK units, um, you know, if you've got naked flames or any any risk of um uh you know any risk of having sparks things like that in the area you need to think about all these things and all the equipment that you're using okay but a lot of the time we we, we need to go up into a loft to survey or, or carry out our treatment you just need to be aware of the of the hazards and not just health and safety hazards but also you know a non-target inspection really really important for cluster flies when we're doing space treatments or we want to do a space treatment or we want to put an electrical fly killer up 
because that matters as well when it comes to bats. You know, the, the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, um, Schedule 5, um, you know, it protects bats. We cannot do anything to bats. And it's just it's not just we can't harm them, but we can't disturb them. If there is any known bat activity in a reef space and you've got flies up there that you want to deal with, you're going to need to get the advice from the Bat Conservation Trust. Um you know, because electric fly killer, that could disturb them. That could, um, you know, bring them out of their um, of their nesting areas. It could, as I said, disturb them or create some sort of disturbance. It's really something you need to be aware of and do your visual inspections. Ask your customer, have you ever had bats here? Do you know if there are any bats here? They say yes or no. Regardless of what they say, you then go and do your own inspection. So you'll look for bat drop-ins um, up in the attic. You can do the crumble test, which um, for those you don't know, mouse droppings and bat droppings can look pretty similar, um, almost identical. But the big difference is that bats feed from insects. So therefore their droppings are a lot more crumbly. So we do the crumble test, which is you, you rub it between your fingers and if it crumbles, it's bats. Whereas mice, their food um, is a lot more uh, there's their dropping, sorry, is uh, a lot more combined. And uh, usually when it dries up, it just goes particularly hard and it's very hard for you to be able to actually crumble that dropping. So the crumble test, don't taste them, whatever you do, just the crumble test. Um, so but if there's any any worries about bats whatsoever, you don't do anything. You advise your customer to speak to that conservation trust. And then if you need something doing with these flies, they'll come out and assess it for you and give you the best advice they can. OK, and always give us a call if you need to talk about it a bit more. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to do my little magic thing. So customer communications. I'm going to ask you what the magic phrase is. I'm imagining you all like shouting it out to me. You know, I know Natalie. I know what her magic phrase is. And that is manage customer expectations. Yay, because that is part of your the challenges you have, you know, talking to the customer i've already mentioned it tell them about cluster flies how they breed um why you can't guarantee that this one space treatment or whatever it is you're doing is going to sort your problem out forever because if you don't manage their expectations they're possibly going to complain aren't they or expect you to come back and if you don't come back and you're a member of the bbca they might ring us and you know have a have a pop at us about you and then we're in touch with you and then nobody's happy so manage your expectations about how cluster flies work um, you know, it's year after year, it could be a problem. Um, if you're treating, you can't guarantee there won't be another recurrence. So really important stuff. That's a, that's a sudden stop. And I'm realizing it's 1321. I cannot believe I've been talking for like 51 minutes. It's it's madness. Everyone at BBCA tells me I talk far too much. But uh, yes, I've been having fun. OK, I um, am got 10 questions from you all um i'm gonna have a little look right drum roll everybody let's see if we can do this so andrew midgley when i spray for cluster flies on the outside of a building should i check for bats entering under the eaves or will the dry pesticide be safe as it is for humans so yeah andrew i mean in terms of um treating buildings on the external fascia of the building the external walls of the building it's not really something we always advise um to be done because mainly you know weather conditions and things like that can affect it a lot um other species of in, of insects that we don't necessarily want to come in contact with that could be a, be a risk if it's on the outside of a building um i would say if you're getting cluster flies and they're on the outside of the building but they're also on the inside then we should be focusing on those inside areas um i mean you also need to have a check i don't know what products you're using so you know i can't give too much direct advice on that but a lot of a lot of uh uh, spray pesticides may say you know for internal use only so just have a look at that um and th that's my advice really um you know it, you say about bats entering under the eaves um i mean if it, it, it's your decision on whether you think what you're doing could um disturb or interfere with the bats and if you have any worries about that being the case then you need to consider it i see your question come in just as we started so hopefully the stuff i've talked about in terms of the bats has answered that but just have a look at your products and make sure you're happy with the way that you're that you're using it okay ian watson so um yes <laughs> ian that was a test um so ian said here 
I think one of my slides, I did mention it actually before I came on the webinar to uh, a colleague of mine, that one of the images um, on the back, should we go back on there? No, I'm not going to share my screen again because, you know, I'll just see if you all remembered it. But there, there was a background and it was flying insects in the background. They were ants. Um, I did mention that about 10 minutes before we started the webinar. And I thought, you know what, I'll bring it up and uh, address it when we're there. I didn't, obviously. Um, but you're right, Ian. Right. That that was that was uh, well uh, you was obviously watching the webinar with um, uh, intent. So, yes, it was ant migration. There were ants flying. Um, so, but hey, you know, um, I, I'm trying to think of someone you can blame. Uh, but, yeah, you're absolutely right, Ian. Uh, they were ants. Um, so, Simon, how long do the adults live for? So, also all weather dependent. Um, it's usually a few weeks. Um, but it's weather dependent, as with all insects, it's, it's <laughs> one of those things they rely on. Um, also, Simon, I normally get majority of cluster flies in October, but if you say four generations, yeah. And this is so four generations in terms of breeding. So in terms of them laying the eggs um, and then also, uh, you know, them, they, those are the generations. So that one a female fly laying an egg um, and that creates a generation and then a bit later on, a week later or so, they lay another batch of eggs. They could have those four generations rather than four occurrences into a property when they're causing problems. There's nothing to say that um, um, that wouldn't happen four times, the issue coming in. But the four generations bit was about the insects laying eggs four times possibly per, per season. Um, do, 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 let's have a look. So, does citronella work well? Do you know what, Stephen? Yep, yeah, some Stephen about citronella. We get questions like that from members of the public a lot. Um, I also, you know, I I couldn't tell you there there is I say studies. There aren't a hell of a lot of studies that I've seen that says yep, citronella works. Why that is? Maybe it's not as profitable for the people studying it or the manufacturers or distributors. I'm not sure. But citronella obviously is a, a known um, deterrent for things like mosquitoes and biting insects. Um, I haven't known about it so much for cluster flies. Um, but, yeah, maybe something to, you know, um, look into and, and, and see. But I haven't seen anything. I've just had someone pop up here saying, no, citronella doesn't work for cluster flies. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't imagine it's normally those biting insects, you know, the mosquitoes and midges that we traditionally see citronella for. But um, I haven't heard that it's, it's good for cluster flies. Um, someone mentioned about smoke treatment. Yeah, I did eventually get to that, didn't I? Um, so you can use smoke generators and, and, and create that space treatment. We call it space treatment. So whether it's with a smoke generator or a ultra low volume particle, um, these are or fogger possibly, uh, these are all space treatments. Um, so what treatment is advised if the attic or loft inhabited by blacks and cluster flies? I think I covered that, Philip, uh, towards the end. Um, again, if there's bats in there, you don't do anything um, until you've spoken or your customers spoke to that conservation and they've come out to assist. It's just, you know, I, I'm not a bags, but I'm not an um, ecologist or expert on, on bats. So I wouldn't say to you, these are the things you exactly need to do um, to be able to ensure there's going to be no risk. That's up to the experts to do that. So you'd need someone to come out and assess it. And hopefully your customer, if they're already aware they've got bats, hopefully they've been um they've been doing uh you know they've done a survey already in the past you know um and if they have then maybe there's some information there that you can get from them um are bats attracted to efks at all it's more that light emission so um whether or not that could disturb them um it really is something to there is an article actually that i'll um i say i'll get cat to share this is putting cat under pressure now but we had an article in the ppc magazine that the bat conservation trust um, wrote for us on pest control um, in attics when you know you've got an issue with bats or you think there might be bats. Now it talks about rodent control a lot, but I know it does talk about EFK, so we can have a look at that. But it's all about that disturbing and you know if if it's in a flight path, so where those bats maybe exit if they're flying, you know, in the space of the attic to get out a certain exit point. You know, if that EFK is not positioned properly, could it interfere with that? Could it stop? Could they? you know, fly into it. There's all these things. So it's not necessarily the bats will be attracted to the EFK that they'll think, oh, there's a nice light over there. Um, so no, they're nocturnal and they they, they don't really do light. Um, but it's that it's that interaction with their environment that's of concern. 
Um, so sorry, what months would you switch EFK units on? I have two in a loft, which I normally leave on all year. And then a little oops. I mean, some people, Matthew, some people do. We've um, done this uh, presentation at the Midlands Forum we had a couple of weeks ago. My colleague, John Horsley, uh, presented it. And, and someone meant, had mentioned that they had issues with cluster flies in, in attics, but they left the EFKs on all year round. Is that a problem? That's your own site survey to do. If you think it's going to be of use, then fine. But, you know, environmentally, is there any reason for you to leave the EFK on, you know, all year round? Maybe not. Um, it, up to you to decide. But there's nothing for me that I'm going to say, oh, no, you shouldn't because of X, Y, Z, um, you know, legislation or anything like that. But I'll probably say, why, why, why would you, you know? Um, and then the times, so the times of year, simply my answer is, when the problems normally start for you. So, you know, if you've installed an EFK in a customer's property, you'll probably have a good idea of what their um, trend is. You know, you may say, well, with them, you know, the cluster flies normally start on the 22nd of September. Um, so you'll think, right, I'll, I'll switch it on. It's generally when that weather starts to change. So um, I would definitely have the EFKs on now if um, you do have them anywhere. Um, and then you turn them off when the activity stops. So, you know, when it when it hits the sort of, you know, five, six degrees, maybe, you know, even usually most insects, anything between 10 and 13 degrees is, you know, they're, they're going to struggle to, you know, move around or, or breed or, or, or actually be successful. So they'll probably be overwintering by that time. So, you know, looking at your area of the country um, and then what the temperatures are looking like. Um, but certainly when it gets to that point where we all need coats on, is normally when the activity will cease. Okay, but each site will vary. Um, now we're officially at 1.30, so we're officially meant to stop now, but I'm not gonna, because you know, that's the way I roll. Uh, we have 11 questions still to go. I'm not gonna be able to do all of them unless of course I get to, you know, I'm, I'm gonna give an extra 10 minutes here. So, you know, there's 250 of you still with me. If any of you need to shoot off, I completely understand. I won't be offended. I won't uh, get in touch with you and, uh, you know, cry or anything. But if you can stay for another 10 minutes, I'm sure it'd be helpful for, for every one of these questions that we've had on here. Um, so uh, I did have a question, but you covered them. Very useful. Okay, that's great. Comment. Um, question is, how long do these overwintering, uh, overwintering flies live? What are you asking there? So when they're overwintering. It's that one generation. Do you mean how long will they overwinter? Um, sorry, Stephanie, I'm not quite sure what you want to know with that, but they will overwinter around that season and they will normally die off. They'll have a variant, um, a variant uh, uh, seasons, but it's that one overwinter that they'll do. They won't generally overwinter twice. Uh, uh, okay, so how frequent should we be checking out AFK in terms of glue board replacement? So, Vincent, when it's full, you know, it might be a day, you know, you, you could have some situations where you put it up and the next day your customer rings you and goes, it's full, you need to come and change it. Um, other situations, you know, you, you put it up and you know, it's not too much of a problem that year, particularly, and maybe you don't have to change it at all. Um, so site specific um, and keep an eye on it, but I, there is no one answer. Just keep an eye on your glue board or get your customer to keep an eye on it uh do we have so uh fipan this is do we have cluster flies in southeast east asia um looks like house flies in a glance for me i don't know i do you know what i think southeast asia that's somewhere i need to bbc ad to send me to go and look into it a bit more for you and uh see whether you have cluster flies <laughs> i'm only kidding i i don't know so um i i would i say i'd imagine so it's not something i've ever really thought about before um you know i'll be looking at it when we're gone but that's not going to be useful to any of you guys now um but yeah they, they can look very similar to house flies especially with the colorations of all insects depending on the health of the insect and you know sometimes vary the the vibrancy of their colors and sometimes can make it tricky to identify so they, they do look similar to house flies it's the it's the habits that they have, the characteristics that they have that will um, help with the identifying. You know, if you're getting a call out and a customer says, oh, I've got thousands of flies or hundreds of flies, and they're all around my windows. You can probably pretty much identify it just from the description on how they're they're acting. But um, yeah, for Pan, I'm not quite sure whether there are any in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, can any residual insecticides work for cracks, gaps, or any rotten object where these 
flight eggs and uh, harboring areas. So yeah, when did this question come in? Yeah, coming not too long ago. So like I mentioned, with with regards to using insecticides, the only stage of the cluster fly we can use insecticides for is the adult. The eggs, everything else, you know, even though eggs and pupae we struggle with, you know, insecticides anyway, because of the penetration, but forgetting that. You can't you can't access where the eggs are being laid or where the harbourage areas are in terms of you know the eggs and the and the uh, larvae and the pupae. It's out there, you know. It's out in the fields. It's out in the rural areas. It's in underneath trees or underneath bushes and shrubs. It, there is nowhere. There is nothing we can do about those larvae uh, and um, the pupae. It's going to be adults only so in terms of what insecticides you can use like i always say you've, there's so many out there you know you've got to speak to your supplier have a look at your label see what it says about you know the formulation whether it's suitable for that surface that you want to use it on and whether it's um you know suitable for the species you want to use it on the label will tell you all you need to know about what you can use that insecticide for um Okay. Uh, any experience with diatomaceous earth for treating cracks and crevices? Um, no. So, I mean, there, you know, it's a powder normally, but you can get it in spray formulations. I, I don't, I'm trying to think why you wouldn't use it. Um, you know, the, the main thing about diatomaceous earth is that you get that insect moving across it so that it attaches to, it absorbs that waxy layer and then um, kills that insect from loss of uh, moisture and loss of loss of liquid or water whichever way you want to see it um so as long as it can get connection with them and i don't see why not um and i always advise looking at the 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 um uh least toxic option so that that's legislation as well as professional service you know if you're thinking right i need an insecticide or i need some sort of you know chemical control then look at the things that are um um, least toxic and diatomaceous earth of course is more of a, a natural product uh, organic product so um, having a look at the label if it says that species on it um, and it says yeah this is what you need to do with it put it there and wipe it there spray it there it tells you everything you need to know you know um, it doesn't matter what I say you can do with something the important stuff's on the label it will tell you what you can do with it there so yeah have a look at your labels that got silica dust or um you know, it's got a, a the, the powder within the the, the wettable formulation. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. So uh, the experience we've got that one. I'm trying to get rid of this. I'm just conscious of time. I'll do one more. So uh, this is anonymous. What's the best way to clear up after a treatment? I in a loft space, you can't really vacuum. Um, also, is it down to the pest control technician as once they're treat? Once they've treated, they become hazardous waste. <laughs> yeah, good question. So um, site specific. So, you know, any if you're putting, for example, an EFK into an attic, normally you can have some sort of catch tray, bucket, bin, whatever below it. And that will hopefully catch everything you need. Um, it's up to you. Take it away. There's no definition. There's, so in terms of it being hazardous waste, there's no definition in the hazardous waste regulations or the European waste codes is how waste is, is allocated. So if you've got some rodenticide and you're like, I want to throw that in the bin, um, I'm going to give it to someone to take away. You always give that the same code, 200119. It's a hazardous code. It's described in the European waste codes. It's clear. That's what it is. Whereas, you know, cluster fly is treated with a, um, you know, a smoke generator. There is no code for that necessarily. There is no, there's no hazardous entry. There's no, you know, um, you say it's contaminated with that, but there, there's no code for it. So um, you labeling it as a hazardous waste is, is really up to you to do that, but it's not something um, that that is said needs to be done. So they can be vacuumed up, put in, you know, general waste. If your customer's happy to do that, if your customer says, no, there's thousands of the bloody things, can you take them away for me? Then yeah, that's going to be waste you need to deal with on a commercial basis. So you want to try and avoid that. Um, but vacuums are fine. You know, vacuums are fine to clear them up um, and uh, and then and then to dispose of. Um, in terms of whether it's a pest controller's responsibility or your customers, that's a conversation to have, isn't it? Um, but managing their expectations in terms of, there's going to be a lot of dead flies, um, I know we. I used to carry around a vacuum with me, and I would certainly 
uh, vacuum up those resulting dead flies. Okay. Um, so Alan Morris here says killing grid machines are much more effective than sticky board units in my experience. Yeah. And that's because of the sheer number that you can, you can catch, isn't it, Alan? Um, yeah. And sticky board machines can look awful when they're overwhelmed. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, I'm going to have to leave you guys. So, um, for quite a good 200 of you have, have stuck with me, I'll go through, we've got another, still another eight or nine questions in there that I haven't managed to get to. Um, but yeah, I've, I've, I'm eight minutes, so nine minutes over already. So, you know, I'm possibly already going to get told off. I won't get told off. Um, but yeah, so thank you everybody for being with us. Remember, if you want to go to Pestex in March next year, get registered, all sorts of wonderful things happening. And of course, we'll all be there. Um, so yeah, come and buy me a coffee. I mean, come and buy us a coffee and, uh, yeah, we'll see you there, but webinar two weeks, humane dispatch. So maybe I'll see some of you there and thank you for being with me. Take care now. Bye-bye.